today. This is Thursday, July the 10th, 2014. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Paul Foley. Welcome, Paul. Thank you, Maureen. May I ask when you were born? Yes, mm -hmm. November 18th, 1954. And where were you born? Natick, Massachusetts at Leonard Morse Hospital. And where do you currently live? Coronado, California. Your marital status? Married. Do you have children? Two boys. Sean is uh, 29 and mm -hmm. Jack is 18. And tell us what Natick was like growing up. Um, basically like a 1950s, early 60s TV show. Mm -hmm. Always doing something. Um, never a dull moment. Sometimes a little drama, but eh, mm -hmm. not too much. But it was, it was fun. I remember just being engaged mm -hmm. all the time in either school or sports or just mm -hmm. playing with friends outside. Now, you're the third member of the Foley family to be recording an interview for the project. Yes. Your father, Francis, a World War II veteran, and your older brother, James, yes. a Marine Corps veteran of Vietnam. Uh, what was that like for you? Um, well, I wouldn't recall my dad's service other than the fact that he didn't talk a lot about it. Mm -hmm. um, and when he did, um, it wasn't a very pleasant conversation for him. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, I remember distinctly, he and my other brother Dan mm -hmm. also deployed to Vietnam as a Marine. Um, Jim was there 67 to 68 mm -hmm. with 2nd Battalion, 3rd Marines. Uh, <clears throat> Jimmy was a, a machine gunner and uh, obviously had some horrific times, um, spent a good part of his time there in combat on a daily basis, mm -hmm. which uh, that's that's quite a feat if you think about it. Um, getting shot at and shooting back every day, that's uh, mm -hmm. to come through that is pretty remarkable. Right. It was, it, for me, I was a little bit, uh, I, I was pretty young, so I was mm -hmm. impressionable, but uh, I always held my two old brothers in the highest esteem. All right. And you went to St. Pat's. I did. And Coolidge Junior High School. Yes, I and, did. And Natick High. Yes. And what year did you graduate? 1973 from Natick High School. And before the interview, you mentioned that you entered the military in 1979. What did you do between graduating from high school and heading into the military? Uh, initially, I got into uh, construction mm -hmm. with um, Jim, my oldest brother. And I recall he and I were working one of the projects that uh, he had gotten me into. And we were, in a, we were in a trench that was pretty deep, well over our heads. And there was very little shoring, if any at all. And we were putting in some three foot drain line, storm oh. drain line. And I remember him looking at me saying, do you really think that you're gonna do this for the rest of your life? And it really made me think, so um, I worked a couple more construction jobs as a laborer and then finally got an apprenticeship as a, mm -hmm. an electrician. So I did that uh, till 1977. I managed to get my journeyman's license in Massachusetts and New Hampshire and subsequently get my master's license in California in 1988. Okay. Where and when did you enter the military? <clears throat> In, um, but out of the Framingham Recruiting Office, mm -hmm. uh, I went through the MEP station in Boston in 1979, okay. in April of 79. Why did you join at the time? Well, given the, uh, the, the events of the day, um, I honestly thought that the United States was on its path to uh, war with uh, the Iranians over mm -hmm. the hostage crisis that uh, lasted well over 400 days. and. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that, uh, I thought the writing was on the wall that Mr. Jimmy Carter's days were over and Ronald Reagan were, would be our next president. Mm -hmm. So uh, I kind of figured I'd get a jump on it. Okay. And what branch did you join? Well, I uh, 
initially I approached the Navy due to my construction experience because the Navy has a, a unit that does construction for contingency construction for mm -hmm. not only the Navy but for the Marine Corps and they spend a lot of time on the, on the ground and I wasn't real keen on getting on board a ship uh, <laughs> and since uh, I had construction knowledge I thought uh, I would fit fairly well into the the Seabees of the mm -hmm. Naval Construction Force. So eventually I got my way after threatening the Navy recruiter that uh, I was going to go talk to the Marine Corps gunnery sergeant if I didn't get what I wanted. Oh boy. <laughs> did family or friends join the service when you did? Uh, no, I, no. Was, uh, okay. I was the only one. Where were you sent for basic? Great Lakes, Illinois. Yep. And tell us what that was like. Cold. It was uh, chilly when we got up there. Uh, it, was a, it was a late spring arriving, if mm -hmm. you will. So um, I recall getting there. There was still lots of snow on the deck in, mm -hmm. in Illinois, up north of Chicago. And um, Not only that, there was uh, a, a very, very cold wind that lasted mm -hmm. for a, a good month. Um, and then on a graduation day in June, uh, I recall standing in ranks and just getting blistered uh, because the sun was a beautiful, bright, sunny, warm day. And we stood out there for about three hours and I just got, I, I looked like a lobster after I was, <laughs> yeah, done. Is there anything else you liked or disliked about it? But, um, uh, boot camp? Yeah, or basic. Mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of marching. Mm -hmm. uh, not a lot of physical training, which I was kind of disappointed with, uh, having been somewhat of an athlete when I was in school. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, <laughs> that's, that was probably my major. I wasn't a very good student. Um, but uh, we, uh, we didn't do a lot of physical activity. Uh, we learned about the Navy, obviously, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that was shipboard stuff and things that I hopefully wouldn't have a lot to do with okay. as a construction guy. Right. Now, of course, you had already had construction experience. Did you receive any other kind of specialized training beyond basic? Yes, I, I went through uh, Construction Electrician A School in Gulfport, Mississippi, right down on the Gulf Coast right next to Biloxi. What was that like? Hot and humid, but I mm -hmm. like hot and humid, so I didn't mind. I, um, there was three, three or four phases of instruction. Mm -hmm. um, one of my favorites was the uh, <coughs> utility line construction where you actually uh, erect power poles and put up all the uh, hardware and the cross arms and hang transformers and string lines and pull secondary conductors and mm -hmm. actually energize uh, a pole field. Uh, it's pretty interesting. So. Yeah. Well, you're not talking just a single telephone pole, but the, the, big, the big towers? or No, these yeah. wouldn't be transmission towers. They would mm -hmm. be utility poles, oh, not okay. telephone mm -hmm. poles. But um, we, our project was, in order to graduate, we had to uh, complete mm -hmm. this particular power project. And how long did the course take? Oh boy, that was 12 weeks long. 12 weeks. Yeah. What happened after Gulfport? Gulfport, I uh, went out to California to, mm -hmm. uh, for, um, I had a military training class that I had to go through. Mm -hmm. And then I shipped out for Subic Bay in the Philippines to report to my first duty station. And that was at uh, CBMU 302 in Subic Bay. Now, before the Philippines, is this like your first time overseas? Yes. And aside from Gulfport and Great Lakes, was that your first time away from Massachusetts? No, no. Mm -hmm. I had uh, actually worked a, a project, uh, construction project down in Florida. Okay. But this is your first time overseas, and tell us what that was like. It was interesting, to uh -huh. say the least. 
<laughs> okay, what uh, what time are we talking about now? 1980? No, this would have been uh, still 1979. I Ooh. think I got there the uh, first week of November of 79. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then to, uh, I want to say a week later, I was, or a week or two later, I was in on the island of Diego Garcia in the middle of the Indian Ocean for my first deployment. Uh, CBMU 302 would send a contingency of people mm -hmm. uh, to perform maintenance functions within a camp that uh, the Seabees lived in. Uh -huh. So um, since we were a maintenance unit, our, our job was to maintain all the ice machines, all the air conditioning, refrigeration, all the uh, power, primary and secondary, within the camp, mm -hmm. and um, just basically keep things running okay. for the rest of the CBs that were on the island doing road projects or runway projects. There was a big pier project going on as well. So, how many CBs were on uh, the island? Sixteen hundred at, at the time, and we were the only people there. Wow. There was some Brit. British people, but uh -huh. uh, they were all military as well. And you're in the middle of the Indian Ocean? Yes. They call it the footprint of freedom. If you look it mm -hmm. up on, on Google Maps, it's in the British Indian Ocean territories, and it's, it is dead set in the middle of, of the I.O., mm -hmm. of the Indian Ocean. How long were you stationed there? Uh, I actually came back from, from there the first time in May, June of 1980 and then a month later I went back again so I spent most of 1980 over there mm -hmm. and then I went for a third time in 1981 before I um, went back to CBMU 302 and stayed there for my last uh -huh. about seven months and and then I transferred back to the US. So you got pretty used to the Indian Ocean. I did, yeah. <laughs> what was it like, the overall it's, experience? You know it's a really beautiful island mm -hmm. and if, uh, if you were to go to there today the, the, of course, the U.S. Navy is still there, but the, uh, uh, the one of the biggest complaints that anybody had back in that when I went was that there was no no wor no girls, no women, and and now there's a, a 40 60 ratio of of 60 percent women that man the island uh, to against 40 percent that are that are guys that are wow. over doing their job. Yeah, so. But the beaches are beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, the lagoon um, is uh, deep. There's quite a bit of wildlife. Uh, it's a little dangerous at times. There's very large eels, mm -hmm. uh, sharks, mm -hmm. um, stone stonefish, lionfish, things yep. like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, all sorts of little creatures that can hurt, just put a hurting on your day. But right. If you were careful, nobody mm -hmm. bothered you. So. And what rank were you at the time? Um, first time I went over there, I was an E3, mm -hmm. and the last time I was there, I was an E5. Okay. So now you're back in the United States. Tell us what happened next. Uh, I went to U.S. Navy Diver School to be an underwater construction diver. Tell us what that was like. That was another 12 weeks uh -huh. that was uh, pretty intense. Um, Diving physiology, all the dive tables that mm -hmm. uh, teach you about recompression, how to get rid of the nitrogen in your blood, and all uh -huh. that stuff. So, because uh, anytime you, you're breathing compressed air under pressure, mm -hmm. it increases the nitrogen in your bloodstream. So, which causes the bends. Yes, it mm -hmm. can, or or it could get worse mm -hmm. if you come to the surface too quickly. It could be a gas embolism mm -hmm. in your bloodstream, or Worse yet, you could actually burst your lungs, which would be Oof. bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a diving construction? There's two teams, so mm -hmm. underwater construction team one mm -hmm. and two. Uh-huh. Um, the UCT2 is in Port Wyanimi on the west coast, mm -hmm. and UCT1 is in Little Creek, Virginia on the east coast. And what is the purpose of the team? They um, they do a lot of waterfront construction. They do a lot of fleet mooring um, inspections and placements. Mm -hmm. They do some underwater demolition at times, uh, mainly just removing debris or mm -hmm. making way for new construction. Um, there was 
I was introduced to them on the island of Diego Garcia because uh, there was a big pier project going on at the time. And all the underwater work that was happening with the uh, concrete forms for the, the pilings, mm -hmm. they were doing that particular function. So it's pretty interesting. Mm. Yeah. All right, 12 weeks are over. You passed, I hope. <laughs> I did. I graduated mm -hmm. April 30 on my mother's birthday in 1982. That's mm -hmm. where I met my wife, Maria, too. Mm -hmm. she, was, uh, she worked at the Navy Exchange on base. <laughs> and where was this again? In Coronado. Cor Coronado, Coronado, California, okay. at the Naval Amphibious Base. Okay. Tell us what happened next. I went to uh, Battalion. I went to uh, Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 4 and subsequently deployed to Okinawa, Japan. Back over the Pacific you yes, go. Yes, yep. And um, Okinawa was uh, different. Mm -hmm. It was uh, okay, a little more built up than, of course, Diego Garcia. Um, a little more modern, if you will, uh, of a of a country, and mm -hmm. there was uh, more things to see, but I didn't get a lot of time to mm -hmm. see many things because it was either one, very expensive, or two, we just didn't have the time left. We used to work uh, about six days, yeah, we averaged about six days a week. It was a pretty rare mm -hmm. week that we And what were your duties? On. I worked a, a, a power project, so I really didn't do a lot of diving. But uh, ran a ran a power line project in uh, Camp um, Oh, gosh, I forget the name of the camp, but I know it was mm -hmm. uh, down south near the city of Naha, mm -hmm. which is the capital city of uh, Okinawa. Okay. And how long were you stationed in Okinawa? That was uh, an eight and a half eight and a half months. Eight that deployment. Months. Tell us what happened next. Well, we came home from Okinawa, mm -hmm. and uh, my chief asked me if I wanted to be assigned to the regiment to be a military training instructor. And I said, sure, what do I have to do? And he says, well, you've you got to pass the interview with the, the Marine Corps staff that's over there, because mm -hmm. um, CB battalions rely on the Marine Corps to provide their uh, basic combat skill and infantry training, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the things that I, after I was accepted by the uh, Marine staff, I became an M60 machine gun instructor. It was fun. It's a, it's a great weapon. First you're diving, now you're running a machine gun. <laughs> okay. Uh, were you had? Did you have to be taught? <coughs> well, I, yes, I have to. Mm -hmm. I had to learn the, the gun mm -hmm. and learn obviously how to do a presentation with the with the weapon, okay. and then be able to convey that information to others. So, it ultimately, it was uh, my last function there as the one of the senior machine gun instructors. It was for me to teach my my instructor staff that was going to replace me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically everything that I knew, so. Um, but I, it was an enjoyable time. We'd mm -hmm. spent a lot of time in the field, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of time doing field training exercises. And where was this? Out of Port Wyanemi in California. Okay, back in California. Yes. And how long did this take? That, well, it lasted for about 15, 16 months. And this takes us to about what, 1984? 1984. Um, yes, 1984. Because mm -hmm. um, from, from there I went to the Naval Construction Training Center in Port Wyanemi, where I was an instructor for C School and then. Uh, what they called uh, special construction battalion trainings, which were little mini classes on mm -hmm. different subjects for the construction electrician trade or the, the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. um, and later I, I was able to get on the book and teach C uh, school, which is a, an advanced class. Right. And um, what was your rank now? 
I was a first class petty officer when I got there, mm -hmm. and which I was an E6. Yeah. And when I left there in 88, I was a chief petty officer. Okay. In the meantime, in California, when did you get married? 1983. Okay. Yeah, December of 1983. And Sean was born in 1985. Okay. So now you're, you're out in California, you have learned how to dive, you've learned how to run a machine gun, you've been teaching people in construction school. Uh, tell us a little bit about what U.S. military presence was like at that time in the early and mid-80s. Mm. It's like a little after post-Vietnam. There was, uh, well, it was uh, the Reagan era, so mm -hmm. we saw um, some advances uh, in the, uh, the Department of Defense overall. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, President Reagan put a great deal of emphasis on uh, a strong military, mm -hmm. so he made sure of that. Um, never got to his 600-ship Navy that he was working towards, but uh -huh. uh, he did bring back the battle wagons for a while, and uh, I don't think they decommed until after the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. So, and those those were pretty impressive. If you ever seen one out, out to sea, they're uh, it's it's a big boat. Mm -hmm. and, the 16-inch uh, guns can do a lot of damage if mm. you give them the opportunity. We're also heading into what turned out to be the latter part of the, the Cold War. Yes. And there were, of course, the incidents in Panama and Grenada. Right. Were you involved in uh, either? No, no? unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I, and then I say that only because I, that's why I joined. I figured, mm -hmm. okay, if, if I got to do this, I might as well go all the way. It's kind of like practicing for the big game and you don't get to play. All right. You know? Well, tell us what happened next. Well, from uh, the Naval Construction Training Center, I went to, mm -hmm. uh, again in Port Wayne, but this was a, um, an aviation command. It was Naval Support Force Antarctica. So Cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was actually assigned to the Winter Over crew which typically spends uh, thir 12 to 13 months down on the, on the ice, as they call it, mm -hmm. on the continent of Antarctica at McMurdo Station. Ah, uh, good old McMurdo. Yes. Have you met others that have been there? Um, not directly, but I've, I've studied Antarctica off and on for a few years, and I've heard a lot about McMurdo. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's one of the bigger bases down there. Mm -hmm. um, run by the National Science Foundation. Right. And the Navy was in a supporting role to, to the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. And um, that was interesting. We, uh, we were in the process of turning over uh, a large part of the Navy's responsibility for the maintenance and upkeep of McMurdo Station to a civilian contractor. Mm -hmm. So by and large, our crew size for the winter would have been, um, on the military side, would have been up to which, uh, 60, mm -hmm. but this time it was, um, the, for 88, 89, I think it was, in, it was half that, it was probably right. 30, 35 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were the 34th Winter Rover crew. So from October, yeah, October of 88 till uh, November of 89. Came home just in time for my birthday. <laughs> yeah. So, and, I, and that was, that was interesting. I, um, I was the chief for the, for the Seabees that were down there. There was, I want to say there was about 14 of us in our shop. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, some eventful days. I remember one day we had uh, an incident at the, the ice pier, and the ice pier literally was a giant ice cube uh -huh. that was lashed together with steel cables, and um, we would do uh, a lift to create another layer, 
after wire rope had been laid out between uh -huh. these bollards. And unfortunately, one of my equipment operators, um, while cleaning the dirt cap off before the, right at winter uh, or summer closeout. Uh -huh. So it's beginning the winter season. Um, whatever dirt we put on the top of it to keep it from melting. Right. Uh, we've got to scrape all of that off and get ready to prepare for future six inch lifts with more wire rope mm -hmm. in between. One of my operators um, actually went through the ice uh, while she was, and she was an EO2, her name was Laura Moody. Uh -huh. uh, she was in an, a completely enclosed cab on a D8 or a D9 dozer. It was one uh -huh. of the largest bulldozers we had. Right. And she had just finished making a push of dirt off the pier. Uh -huh. And when she put it in reverse, the edge of the pier gave way. The dozer slid to the right and just went straight to the bottom. So she was at, right at about 30 feet where she was in the cab. Uh -huh. And this was the only bulldozer that we had that had a glass top. Right. But she had glass on both sides front and back and as those pieces of glass o were overcome by the bottom pressure uh -huh. they collapsed inboard oh my but it also pushed the glass up uh -huh. and she said she rode an air bubble all the way to the surface she didn't get wet until she was on the surface of the, you mean she survived yes yeah, she survived wow yeah and i went to, that was a thursday i'll remember that like i was like it was yesterday mm. and um we had, they had just finished a little chapel, mm -hmm. and that was a Thursday afternoon. I went to the chapel every Thursday afternoon after that, mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. afternoon, religiously. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else from your time in Antarctica? Um, yes, uh, the, our runway crew that uh, prepared the, the sea ice runway landed, um, built the runway long enough to... to have the U.S. Air Force fly the very first C-5 mission into wow. McMurdo Station and landed on sea ice. Of course, the sea ice was about 10, 10 to 12 feet thick, I think mm -hmm. was the average. Yeah. And a, at the time, the only other Air Force plane that uh, had flown down there uh, that was a jet was the C-141. Mm -hmm. um, the C-5, while larger, actually since it had so many wheels in mm -hmm. its undercarriage, displaced less ground pressure mm -hmm. per square inch than uh, the C-141 did. So it was uh, beneficial to the, to the mission. Uh, the first, uh, I want to say the first C-5 mission brought in four, three or four mm -hmm. of the uh, Navy helicopters that would support the National, National Science Foundation. Right. Uh -huh. So... They, uh, they brought in a, a ton of gear on that first one, and then subsequently they flew in a, a two or three other missions um, and brought most of the rest of the squadron's assets with them. So, and the, the, uh, the, first, the first flight in, the first C-5, was landed by the commanding general of Pacific Air Forces. He, he was a three-star general. Yow. Yeah, so he was pretty stoked. Mm-hmm. All right, Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, Antarctica. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, no, I can't say that it was uh, an unhappy day to leave there. Mm -hmm. You know, it was uh, that was pretty exciting. Okay. And I made a lot of uh, very good friends down there, mm -hmm. especially uh, my friends that live in New Zealand, because the uh, the Kiwis, as they call themselves, they ran our cargo operations at the airfield, and. Um, so I got to spend some time in New Zealand before I came back to the States. Mm -hmm. Spent that time with a friend of mine by the name of Gus Warner and his wife Susan and their two boys. So that was about five days. Nice. Yeah, so we, we had a good time. All right, back in this country? Uh, just for a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. picked, uh, picked up Maria and yeah. Sean from uh, Port Wyanimi, and we headed north to Adak, Alaska. In Not the, another cold place. In, in the uh, Aleutian Islands, yeah. Yep. 
it was a naval air station, so it was uh, that was different. I worked mm -hmm. at the public works department, and I, I had uh, four different four different shops: the boiler shop, the mm -hmm. uh, the, the washer dryer shop. I had the con all the the interior wiring shop, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> let me see what else. I know I did something else. Oh, uh, our shop provided electricians to the uh, um, to the power mm -hmm. production side, uh, power production and power line maintenance mm -hmm. for the distribution of power throughout the island. Now, how far along on the Aleutians were you stationed? Uh, ADAX, mm, about um, two thirds of the way down. Okay. From from the mainland. So you're actually fairly close to both Russia and Japan. Um, yes, because okay. there's uh, probably four, four or five other mm -hmm. smaller islands that are after ADAC that extend out into mm -hmm. the, I believe that's the Bering Sea, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So you're actually up there at a pretty interesting time, yes. the fall of communism. Um, yeah, and we got alerted. Uh, quite often, because mm -hmm. by this time it's 1990. Right. Um, we used to get uh, when I stood watch on the quarter deck, we would get flash uh, flash message traffic uh, alerting us that uh, Soviet um, aircraft were approaching our vicinity, and they were always intercepted either mm -hmm. by uh, Air Force fighters that were out of uh, Shemya Island, which is even farther out on the chain mm -hmm. than we are. Or from aircraft, U.S. aircraft that were flying out of Elmendorf Air Force Base in Anchorage. Anything else about your time in the Aleutians? Um, the, the big mission there mm -hmm. was uh, keeping the airfield open. Mm -hmm. um, so our equipment operators uh, did a lot of plowing during the winter time, and um, we did. We did some projects. It seemed like it was always snowing. The wind was always blowing. It was, uh -huh. or it was always raining. Um, the commanding officer would, at times, call "Sunshine Liberty," mm -hmm. if uh, if there was a particularly nice day, uh, and if the sun was shining, he would authorize the department heads to uh, cut their people loose for the remainder of the day. Otherwise, uh, you were working most of the time. Right. Well, what would happen during Sunshine Liberty? Just Bask. <laughs> yes, just uh, try and go out and suck up some vitamin D oh. and, a, and a little bit of warmth. <laughs> and how long were you stationed in the Aleutians? Uh, that was two two years, six months. Yeah, about two and a half two and a half years. And how did your wife and son like it? Um, as you know, it wasn't until about halfway through the uh -huh. tour of duty that uh, Maria actually. Mm -hmm started to enjoy herself because she was, uh, uh, she didn't have any friends up there initially, so, and she could be a little shy at times, mm -hmm. so we had some neighbors who were very friendly, and subsequently Maria became very fast friends with oh, good. a couple of our neighbors, and uh, that was a good thing. Yeah. Okay. Tell us what happened after the Aleutians. Well, I went to NMCB-5, Naval Mobile Construction Battalion 5, out of Port Wyoming, California. Back to California. <laughs> I'm telling you, yeah. I made uh, two deployments with uh, mm -hmm. NMCB-5, the first one down to Panama in the Canal Zone. Mm -hmm. um, we were at Rodman Naval Station, which is on the uh, south end, which is um, on the Pacific side. and. Um, we, we did a, a big camp for, there was go, it's going to be some kind of housing project for transient folks, I believe, mm -hmm. but it was basically like a big trailer park, but more permanent than not. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, my CBs were in charge of the, basically building that up, and they did a great job. Nice. They did a really good job. I remember that when it, when it rained down there, it rained really, really hard, and uh, it the, it would come down in droves. Uh -huh. Literally, you thought the the ocean had just jumped into the sky and it was falling on you. But at least it wasn't freezing. No, it wasn't cold <laughs> at all. No, not at all. And there was very large bugs mm -hmm. there, very large. 
And then uh, my next deployment with NMCB-5, I went to uh, Pohang, Korea. South Korea. Oh, South Korea, yeah. okay. Yeah, it's on the uh, east coast of Korea, just uh, about a third of the way up the east coast from uh, Busan, okay. um, mm -hmm. the big port facility. And Pohang was also a port facility, but it was home to the uh, POSCO uh, Steelworks. Mm -hmm. POSCO Steel was, uh, at the time, it was the second largest uh, steel producer in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, only, only outgunned by some outfit in France, but POSCO was on a, on a growth scale. Right. Um, and I remember that anytime they smelted uh, iron ore, and produced the, the ingots. Mm -hmm. um, there was always about one or an inch to two inches of ash that would fall on our camp, just like a blanket of snow. Not big on the EPA over mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. a, at the time, they weren't anyway. So and that was what, 90, 94. Okay. And what were your duties when you were in South Korea? Uh, we had a number of projects to do. Mm -hmm. um, we were at a Marine Corps camp, and they were closely associated with the uh, the Rock First Marine Division. Uh, so that's the Republic of Korea First Marine Division, and the U.S. Marines always maintained a very uh, friendly relationship with them. They do a lot of uh, combined training together. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Marines had a camp there, and we did a number of. Uh, construction projects for them. Okay. What happened after that? Um, let's see. Uh, came back to California mm -hmm. and packed up. I had 15 years in by this time. I packed up and went to Gulfport, Mississippi, where I was um, the construction electrician school director at the Naval Construction Training Center. So back to the instructor mm -hmm. bit. And how long were you stationed in Gulfport? Um, 90, 95 to 97. Okay. Anything about your experiences there? That was, uh, that was pretty interesting. I actually made uh, senior chief while I was down there. Senior chief, okay. And. Um, <clears throat> I, initially, I went there as the construction electrician school director, and then mm -hmm. I became the Bravo Company chief, and later, later the Bravo Company, and then mm -hmm. uh, Bravo Company commander. Um, and, we, and then we changed our names because we had combined with another company. So we became the Advanced Schools Company. So I was the Advanced Schools Company commander, which all that meant was more paperwork, uh, you know. So, but it was an enjoyable tour. I enjoyed the people that I worked with. Alrighty, so two years in Gulfport. Tell us what happened next. Um, from there, I, I had an interview um, while I was still in Gulfport with a lieutenant commander by the mm -hmm. name of Bob Curia. And Bob had been the uh, staff engineer at the Naval Special Warfare Command uh, staff. Uh -huh. And he was putting together two teams of Seabees to support Navy SEALs. So well, he asked me if I wanted to be the senior enlisted guy for the West Coast team. Uh -huh. And I talked with Maria about it for about 10 minutes because she said, well, you're going to do what you want anyway. And I <laughs> said, well, don't you want to go back to California? She goes, I don't care. Yeah. You, you tell me what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, we're going. So I talked to Mr. Uh, Commander Curia that, that morning, mm -hmm. told him, hey, we're all in. So... I had another two or three months, I think, uh, left in Gulfport, and off we went back to the West Coast. My first time in San Diego, outside of dive school. Right. So now you're involved with the Navy SEALs. Yes. Yeah, that was a bit of a challenge, because there was mm -hmm. only, um, oh boy, there was 13 of us on the original mm -hmm. team, and the idea was... Uh, we uh, would be the 
camp specialists, if you will, mm -hmm. and relieve the SEALs of any duties of either establishing a camp or doing any of their forward logistics so they could basically combat or, or mm -hmm. co uh, concentrate on their combat missions. Right. So um, our, our job was to basically take care of all the rudimentary stuff that, uh, mm -hmm. that goes along with uh, deploying a force to the, to the field in order to do the job. Can you give me an example? Uh, yeah, well, one of our first projects was we built this huge camp in, uh, back in Korea, in uh, Chinhae, mm -hmm. which is just uh, to the west of Busan, uh, formerly Pusan. Um, right. mm -hmm. So uh, Chinhae has the naval, the naval presence of the U.S. and uh, the ROC Navy, the combined headquarters. So we built a 250-man camp there for a very large exercise that uh, went off pretty well. We did that uh, three or four years running mm -hmm. and pulled it off every year. Not only we we did it there, but we also did it a couple other places. Um, a few times in this in the, one of the Gulf states, either um, Qatar or uh, Kuwait mm -hmm. in uh, in the Persian Gulf. Um, and also in Africa, in Kenya. Wow. So the one in Kenya was a, a little lower key, but mm -hmm. it's still, uh, the guys went in there, and it, the, the camp or the space that they were going to occupy was overrun by a, a tribe of baboons or whatever you call them. What are they, a congress of baboons, I think? Uh huh. Yeah, so um, they, had to, they had to get rid of those animals first. That proved to be a bit of a challenge. Okay. <laughs> so, but they uh, they moved in and got everything cleaned up, and there, it was quite a bit of a cleanup, too. I, yeah, uh, yeah. you're overrun by baboons. Yeah. They, they're not the neatest animals. No, no, mm. not, not at all. <laughs> um, so that, that's, uh, that was some of our guys' work. So we, And we had another team that um, supported... We were basically broken up into the PACOM theater, the CENTCOM theater and the Korea mm -hmm. uh, piece because those were uh, the areas of focus at the time. So uh, the PACOM guy or guys were uh, challenged for the for a big part because there was only two of them, mm -hmm. and they uh, they leveraged a lot of different things, but mm -hmm. they they always pulled it off. They always pulled it off. Wow! So it was uh, pretty challenging. But interesting, mm -hmm. and I did that from what ninety seven to two thousand one, and then then I was on shore duty for a little while. Yeah, uh, from two thousand uh, what April of two thousand one till uh, February of two thousand four uh -huh. um, at the Naval uh, Leadership Training Unit. I initially went there as uh, as a master chief. Um, as an E9 and as a facilitator. Mm -hmm. So you, you're not an instructor, you're, you're basically trying to get people to contribute to the curriculum vice, just mm -hmm. spitting out certain lesson plans. So you want to get everybody's involvement, um, okay. which is, it's a lot like instructing, so it wasn't, right. it wasn't that difficult. But then later I was the Command Master Chief there, so. Okay. As the and was this back in California? Yes, it okay, was. Back in it was in San Diego. So okay. no movement involved. That's good. And I honestly thought I was going to retire out of there. Mm -hmm. And um, I got a call from my detailer, who's the job assignments guy. Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I thought I was going to retire. And he says, well, would you like your old job back at Naval Special Warfare? And I said, mm -hmm. heck yeah. So I did that from 94 until, oh, I'm sorry, from 2004 mm -hmm. till I retired in 2009. Okay, I'm going to step back just a little bit. And to, uh, where, where you, what were you, you doing September 11, 2001? I remember um, I was drinking a cup of coffee on the couch watching mm -hmm. the news, and the first plane had just hit the first tower. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the second plane hit the second tower, what was it, 15 minutes later? Right. Um, 
I told Maria, I said, get ready for this because we're going to war over, with somebody over mm -hmm. this. This isn't an accident. Initially, the, when the first tower was hit, you know, people were um, opinionating that, oh, it was just an accident, you know, it was a horrible accident, but mm -hmm. it was just an accident. Well, you knew it wasn't an accident, especially after that second one hit. Mm -hmm. so. And of course, a couple of years later, war in Iraq, Yes. war yeah. in Afghanistan, and you spent some time over there too. I spent some time in Iraq, uh, both times with uh, SEAL Team 3. And tell us about that experience. That was, uh, that was interesting. I actually, mm -hmm. well, I, I ended up, I, I worked like I was a, a trooper again, mm -hmm. you know, if you will, if I was like, I was, <laughs> I was a master chief, but I, I was helping get the job done along with everybody else. Mm -hmm. So, because uh, we just we didn't have enough people to be ordering others around because mm -hmm. there was nobody else there to do right. it. So I, I lost a lot of weight, which was good because mm -hmm. I could have I could have used that. You right. Uh, you said you had two deployments. Yes, uh, the first one was from. Let me see. I want to say September of two thousand four to April, May, May of 2005. Okay. And then the next one was in 2006. And I left the day after St. Patrick's Day. Mm -hmm. I was on the East Coast for St. Patrick's Day and I left the following day. I was in Virginia. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, okay. Um, and got over there a little bit early because we were doing a big move from uh, the camp that the team had been mm -hmm. in prior, uh, around the ba um, Baghdad airport. Mm -hmm. And we were moving <coughs> west into Anbar province, and uh, so we moved to Camp Fallujah. And uh, yeah, there was a, a little bit of a sticking point, because mm -hmm. the, the roads were uh, frequently uh, IED'd or, you mm -hmm. know, there was always a chance of somebody, um, something nefarious mm -hmm. happening. Now, you've been a C in CBs now for about 25 years up to this point, and was this your first time in a war zone? Yes. And what was your reaction, feelings, experience? Uh, I was uh, a lot of excitement uh, uh -huh. combined with uh, moments of sheer terror. Okay. And you had actually sent me a little uh, clip of a convoy yes. undergoing an attack from an IED. <laughs> yes, yes. That was, uh, that was actually from 2006. 2006, okay. Yes. And um, we were conducting several road movements, if you will, mm -hmm. from Fallujah to an air base, uh, which was even further west that we had to get to in order mm -hmm. to do our rotation with the team that was relieving us. Mm -hmm. And that um, video is all infrared. Mm. Um, it's kind of grainy. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, the video is called, they call it Intel Surveillance and Reconnaissance, ISR. Mm -hmm. And that was provided to us by a video feed called Tiger Shark. That was the it was a UAV, mm -hmm. and that UAV was supposed to be watching the, the, the road to let us know that, um, hey, there might be an IED right there. Mm -hmm. uh, we never got that call. So subsequently, our lead truck triggered the vice. I was in mm -hmm. the second vehicle in that, right. in that movement. So it was a good thing, too, um, the way that they had placed the they had stacked two artillery rounds, mm -hmm. but they put them in backwards. So most of the explosion went away from the road, vice coming right across the road. Right. Uh, but it still, it, it threw up a hellacious fireball and mm -hmm. just dust everywhere. It was incredible. Okay. And of course, you must have been wearing full battle. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plus we were we were all driving on night vision. So uh -huh. um, yeah. we 
we always drove uh, fast mm -hmm. and uh, always at night and always blacked out. Uh, so no lights anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, makes it a bit of a challenge. Right. Especially when you have a big fireball in front of you. So. <laughs> really? I mean, this is also, again, based on your experiences, you've been Antarctica, Okinawa, the Phil. I mean, you were all over the place. Uh, well, how did how did Iraq compare to your other experiences? Uh, dusty. Dusty. Dusty, mm -hmm. and um, I remember vivid, quite vividly, when mm -hmm. we left Iraq. Um, well, I got off the plane in Germany mm -hmm. at uh, Ramstein Air Base, and just the as soon as I stepped out of the plane, the thing that hit me the most was just the overwhelming overwhelming smell of the green, of the forest mm -hmm. that surrounded that place. It was one of the, it was one of the best things ever. Mm -hmm. Really, it was, it was, yeah. it was awesome. Okay. Whew. Tell us what happened next. <laughs> well, um, I had uh, intended on going back uh, with Team 3 in 2008. Uh, subsequently, I was told by the Group 1 Master Chief, mm -hmm. um, Naval Special Warfare Group 1 was our immediate superior right. to the command that I worked at. So uh, the Group 1 Master Chief told me that I was taking the job of Command Master Chief at, uh, at my command. So I did that for six months until the next uh, appointed Command Master Chief came in, who was also another guy from Massachusetts, by mm -hmm. the way. His name is uh, Rich Puglisi. He's a uh -huh. he's a Navy SEAL, and typically at the command that I that I currently work at, and it's also the command that I retired from. Mm -hmm. uh, we have four positions, four or five positions that are normally held by Navy SEALs. So our commanding officer is a supply officer. Mm -hmm. Our executive officer is a SEAL. Mm -hmm. Our command master chief is a SEAL. Our combat systems officer is a SEAL. And we also have an operations officer. He is a SEAL. Mm -hmm. And we have an operations uh, master chief who is also a SEAL. All right. So, yeah. Okay. Fun people to know. They, <laughs> they really are. <laughs> All right. So you're back from Iraq. You're, sp you're back in California. Yes. You were command master chief for six months, and you retired in two thousand nine. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. What have you been doing these days? Well, uh, Maureen, I work for the command that I mm -hmm. retired from. They actually called me back into a civilian position mm -hmm. to work in the operations office. Uh, the commanding officer that I worked for at the time of my retirement had actually talk to me mm -hmm. about the potential for this particular position coming up because mm -hmm. uh, he envisioned having a continuity in place, if you will, within the operations shop because uh, prior to that, it seemed like every time we had a, a, new, a new operations master chief or a new operations officer roll in, uh, things were, the corporate knowledge went out the door, so mm -hmm. things had to be relearned. Right. So subsequently, my job is to say, yeah, that might sound like a good idea, but we tried that a couple of years ago. It didn't work, so mm -hmm. that's why we do it this way. The and institutional memory. Yes, well, I try to be, as, mm -hmm. long as, I, <laughs> as long as I can do that, I guess I'm okay. wanted. And what rank did you retire? As a, as a Master Chief. As a Master Chief, yes. okay. Now, you mentioned you have two sons. Did I, either son get interested in the military? Um, my youngest, Your youngest currently is uh, mm -hmm. hoping to join the Navy. Okay. That's uh, Jack. Okay. And I have your personal sheet here, and you have medals. <laughs> Tell us about the two bronze stars you won. Um, those were meritorious awards. Mm -hmm. um, they're bronze stars because they were... Um, were earned in a combat zone, mm -hmm. so it, uh, it's not like I was in a run and gun fight every day. Right. You know? I didn't. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any of that. Mm -hmm. 
Although the only times, the only times we were ever shot at, I mm -hmm. could never shoot back because mm -hmm. I was either driving a truck mm -hmm. or I was a passenger in a truck, and uh, and that's aside from, you know, being in a camp or being somewhere where you're you're getting what they call indirect fire, which mm -hmm. is either mortar or rockets, and it's, it's kind of hard to shoot back at those. You, right. You have to determine the point of origin and mm -hmm. be fairly accurate with your return fire. Mm -hmm. In the years that you served with the CBs, you've been practically all over the world, I, and I know you were kept very, very busy uh, while you were on your tours. Did you ever have a chance to kind of check out the culture? Uh, yes. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, in um, Okinawa, mm -hmm. I went to one of their, uh, I, I guess it would be referred to as an indigenous wildlife uh, show yeah, mm -hmm. at one of their cultural centers. Mm -hmm. And we met a, a, an assorted variety of uh, snakes and other reptilians. Mm -hmm. There was a uh, snake over there called the habu. It's a poisonous viper, which... Yeah. Um, was uh, you didn't want to come across one of those, mm -hmm. but they they pretty much kept to themselves. Um, they hibernated quite a bit. Right. And uh -huh. Normally they were nocturnal creatures, so you really didn't have to worry about them too mm -hmm. much. What about when you were in Iraq? Did you ha have a chance to interact with the local people? Just uh, just a few. Not, just a few. Not not many. There were some people that worked on on the base. Right. Um, that were fully vetted uh, locals that didn't try to do anything bad. Uh, so I, I got to know some of those fellows pretty good, mm -hmm. but um, not to any great length. But mm -hmm. I, I came to know that I think intrinsically people all over the world, they just want to do right by their families. Mm -hmm. And at least normal people want to do right by their families and uh, live peacefully for the most part. And then there's always the assorted whack jobs out there that just are, just create hate and dis mm. distemper for everybody. Mm -hmm. Have you joined any military service organizations or veterans groups? I'm a, actually a member of the, uh, I'm a life member of the CB Veterans of, uh, of America. Okay. And I'm, there's a VFW in my, in our town in Coronado, which I'm, I've been putting off my life membership with them until I uh -huh. turned 60, so that's coming right around the corner, so I think okay. I'll do that. <laughs> Paul, how important has it been for you to serve in the military? Um, Maureen, I would do it absolutely all over again, mm -hmm. absolutely. It um, gave me a chance to uh, see many things, many places. Um, wasn't always one of those pit stops on the jet set place mm -hmm. to go, mm -hmm. but uh, they were always interesting and they were always, uh, they were, it was always pretty cool. I, I recall doing a, a diving trip in, while well, I was in Okinawa. Mm. And it, uh, we took a ferry ride out to the Karamas Islands. Mm. And if my history is correct, the Karamas Islands were the initial staging point for the U.S. invasion of Okinawa. Mm -hmm. So those islands were captured initially by either Marines or Army infantry, one of the two, or maybe both. And it was a group of three islands that uh, form this U-shaped uh, channel. Uh, very strong currents that ran between the islands, but the islands themselves, they were a perfect logistic hub for the assault on the, on the beaches. So after the war, it became a national uh, underwater park for the, for the Japanese. Mm. And the, the, the wildlife that's down there is in, absolutely incredible. And once you get past the surface current under, underneath, once you're down about 20 feet, uh, you, you really, you can hang out on the bottom. There's very little movement of the water. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely mm -hmm. gorgeous. We took some uh, dried mackerel down there with us, and, and to mm -hmm. feed other fish. Oh, okay. <laughs> and they are cannibals. They, well, they, 
you, all you had to do was hold up one of these dried mackerels and you would have th literally thousands of, <laughs> it looked like a rainbow of color just swirling about your head because they were all coming in for a bite of this, this mm. mackerel. <laughs> and um, we had a, a Japanese guide with us that brought us over to this pretty good sized hole in the, in the sea floor. Uh -huh. Looked like a manhole, literally without the manhole cover. And he cautioned us to stay back. And mm -hmm. he had told us on the surface, he said, no, no cameras. No, no cameras. No pictures of this particular animal. Uh-huh. Because he dangled a, a dried mackerel over the hole, and an eel came out of that hole that literally filled the hole. And he, to me, he looked like he was the size of a manhole. Wow. And he brought him, he brought him out about a good six feet. And he was still coming. Yikes. There, yeah, there wasn't any end to him in sight. So, <laughs> just he was a big, big animal. Okay. Paul, is there anything else you'd like to say for this interview? Um, Maureen, I, I can't thank you, the, the Morse Institute, and, mm -hmm. and your crew uh, for mm -hmm. doing this. I, I think it's a great thing. I'm glad that uh, mm -hmm. you got a chance to talk to my dad and mm -hmm. uh, my brother Jim. Hopefully, you'll get a chance to talk to my brother Dan. I'll see him tomorrow, so okay. I'll tell him to pump you up. And, okay. Um, really, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank very you. Much. This okay. has been great. Mm -hmm.